organized by the International Society of Nephrology and hosted by the Canadian Society of Nephrology and La Société Québécoise de Nephrologie, this year's World Congress of Nephrology is a gathering of thousands of participants and leading experts in kidney healthcare to exchange the latest science and discuss the newest clinical applications designed to improve kidney health and prevent kidney disease worldwide. Welcome to the ISN's WCN Daily Show. Welcome to the first episode of the WCN Daily and thanks for joining us. I hope you've all been enjoying the fascinating sessions from featured experts in kidney health and are excited for all of the upcoming sessions over the next few days. From effects of COVID-19 on renal services in low and middle income countries to AKI in pregnancy. WCN hopes you'll enjoy these high quality educational experiences and find opportunities for scientific discovery. On today's show, we host a discussion with Policy Forum keynotes Sir George Alain and Dr. Adira Levin on ISN's Global Kidney Policy Forum. But first, we're joined by ISN Scientific Chair Claire Sharp, who'll be highlighting some of her session highlights from both today and tomorrow's sessions. I think, first of all, I'd like to highlight the opening ceremony with Timothy Caulfield. He discussed the ever-growing problem of pseudoscience and misinformation, and it's such a topical subject at the moment. It's given us all food for thought on how we interpret what we hear from a variety of sources um, that come at us from all, all aspects of the media these days, so I think that was a really insightful session. I'm particularly interested as well in the mechanisms, personally, that underpin the pathophysiology of acute kidney injury leading to chronic kidney disease. So the cutting-edge research presented in the session that was jointly run with the American Society of Nephrology gave a really good overview of the latest basic science in this field, particularly focusing on how disordered cellular metabolism and signaling pathways can lead to renal fibrosis, which I thought was fascinating. Well, we've got a lot to look forward to tomorrow. We'll have our first ever member suggested session on the impact of COVID-19 on renal services in low and middle income countries. When we were putting this programme together, we had thought that we would be looking back and we'd be reflecting on the pandemic um, and how it affected us and how we'd come through it. But as we're aware, we're still really very much in the middle of it. So it's so important that we come together, we share our experiences and we learn from each other and how we can move forward. Um, first of all, I'm looking forward to the Young Nephrologist session. We're going to hear about how the ISN programme has supported um, young nephrologists across the world, and particularly focusing on the, the pathway, the journey of one in Canada. Another networking session that's close to my heart is the Women in Nephrology session. And that's really going to look at the struggles that women have had in leadership positions, particularly in low and middle income countries, and also on how the pandemic has affected women in this way. Thanks, Claire. Now make sure you don't miss out on these and all of the other great sessions from WCN 2021, all of which are available after they air on the WCN virtual platform. And now over to Keynotes, Dr. Adira Levin and Sir George Alain. Well, thank you very much, um, George, for actually agreeing to participate in this Global Policy Forum. It's uh, one, it's the third one that we've done, uh, and this is at the World Congress of Nephrology, but if I remember correctly, this isn't the first one you've attended, is that right? You're quite correct. It's interesting, this is the third policy forum. I remember the third International Congress of Nephrology. This was held in Washington, D.C., and this stands out in my memory, so it's a good thing you asked about it. And what I remember very well about that conference was the great debate about who should be dialyzed. At that time, dialysis was not available widely. There's a lot of debate about the ethics of dialysis, who should have dialysis. Of course, the discussion is much less now. Uh, I attended all of the others until I uh, left to come to Papua in 1981. And the International Society was really my, 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 my one of my academic homes, as you may call it. 
That's fantastic. And, you know, it's interesting you talk about the ethics, but, you know, in fact, some things haven't changed because there are still questions in different countries around the world about who should and shouldn't get dialyzed for various reasons. So, you know, it's not always so different. But I guess the other thing is, so your career took you into the realm of health policy. And so tell us about how that happened. Uh, uh, I was chairman of the Department of Medicine and we had started uh, that, that nephrology clinical practice. In fact, before I left, most of my work was in, 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 on, in two dimensions. And these were the dimensions that I found so interesting in international congresses. First of all, there was clinical nephrology and also there was experimental work. And we had done a lot of work on renal biochemistry. But when I left uh, from academic medicine to come to PAHO, my, the whole focus changed. I was no longer practicing nephrologist. I was no longer seeing patients. I no longer have a, had a lab. Uh, and I shifted entirely uh, from an, being an academic physician to being a, 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 a I, I tell people I became a bureaucrat. <laughs> Well, I, I joined the Pan American Health Organization in 1981, and I confess I always, I always had a, uh, almost a, a separation complex from the International Congress of Nephrology. So maybe it's fitting that you've come back into the fold, right, to talk about, um, you know, we, we had a conversation earlier about the kidney as, from a policy perspective, the canary in the coal mine, right? Like no. that, in a way, kidney health might be a really interesting nidus, if you will, of the health of a society or the, you know, because it, it, it can tell you a lot about um, fetal maternal health, nutrition, infectious exposures, et cetera, if one thinks of it that way. And so maybe um, it isn't by mistake that a nephrologist went to PAHO and, uh, and find yourself um, at, the, at the Global Policy Forum, at the Kidney Health Policy Forum. So I'm uh, interested in your thoughts about how one might leverage or, or look at the kidney in respect to global health. The kidney relates to every other discipline. You cannot be a good nephrologist unless you have a, a good understanding of many other disciplines of medicine. And in that sense, uh, to be a good nephrologist, so to have a good nephrology practice or to have nephrology being seeded into public health really allows you to have a wider view of what is happening in health as a, in, in general. So it was actually you who used that expression, canary, and I like that very much. It's a good indicator of some of the things that happen in medicine, in health in general. Yeah, great, thank you. Now, Adira, this year's Global Kidney Policy Forum takes place against the setting of a global pandemic. How has this shifted the ISN's health policy approach? So it's a great question, Sam, uh, and I think it's really important that we reflect that really during a world pandemic, what you highlight is inequities and disadvantages in, in population health. And I think that part of the ethos of the Global um, Kidney Health Forum is to actually help identify um, better access to care, better access to kidney health. And if nothing else, certainly this pandemic has helped us to um, become even more aware of those inequities around the world. And even in this region, the Caribbean, North American region, the disproportionate number of people who both required dialysis for acute kidney injury and the, what that did to resources. Uh, and we talked earlier about the fact that sometimes you have to decide who does and doesn't get dialysis. Well, that actually has had to occur in some places around the world in terms of the pandemic. We know that the coronavirus also impacts the kidney. And so looking to see not just acute kidney injury, but potentially longer term changes, proteinuria and hematuria are well described in the absence of changes in kidney function initially. So we may have another kidney um, epidemic on our hands over time, especially in vulnerable populations. So I think there's a lot of different ways that this pandemic and, and what ISN is going to is doing is just trying to make sure that um, those messages are clear and consistent over time. The regional focus of this year's policy forum is on North America and the Caribbean. What do you both think are the key kidney health policy issues that need to be addressed in the region? And what are the possible solutions? Sir George? Let me begin from where Adira left off. 
and speak about what I think is the major, the mega problem that affects uh, this region. And because I'm not a practicing nephrologist, I can't speak of the details of uh, kidney damage in the Americas. But what I can speak of is the causes of the causes, the things that are behind the problems in kidney uh, disease in the Americas. And that is inequity. And in my presentation at the conference, this is the thing I'm going to harp on. It is the differences between people. It's the differences between groups of people, not only between countries, but within countries. That really is the driver for the problem that exists in kidney health in the Americas. Yeah, and I guess yeah, just to highlight that on top of, of what you've said, maybe I amplify some things that um, what uh, the North American Caribbean reminds us is that even in what appears to be high income places, especially Canada and the US, there are huge inequities even there. And even in my country, Canada, which is queer, quote unquote universal healthcare, there are still inequities and they have to do with geography, education, um, cultural and ethnic diversity. And those are the things that ultimately uh, this policy form is attempting to highlight for policymakers. So it's not good enough to say that you have, you know, access to, uh, to health care that's free if you live a thousand miles from the nearest physician or health station. You don't have equal access to care. Well, thank you both so much for talking with us today. Thank you, Sam, for facilitating and asking us questions and helping to keep us on track. And let me thank Adira for being such a good conversationalist. <laughs>